So this is an Appalachian chanterelle. It's not as tasty as other chanterelles, but it's still a good edible mushroom. And any edible is important in a survival situation. Pawpaw tree. And here is some pawpaws. They won't be coming ripe until later in August or September. And you'll know when they're ripe because they'll feel a little softer, kind of like a avocado or something like that. This is going to come into view. At first glance, what I believe this is, is a black staining polypore. I'll tear off some of it here. Here is some black raspberries. You can tell they're raspberries. They look kind of like blackberries, but instead of just turning red, a lot of the little ones are real white. And when you pull them off, unlike a blackberry, the whole open core there so he pulls out of it and we have here at the bottom of these pine trees is a cauliflower mushroom and it's still very firm so that's a good edible mushroom right there with the reishi mushrooms i've harvested two of them harvested two and i left one and that's my practice well, it's commonly known as yellow root, and that yellow that's in the root, that is berberin. And that compound berberin will help kill any bacteria that you got in your throat. So a highly medicinal plant that can be used in the same way as golden seal. This is the true turkey tail. It's got zones, and the false turkey tail right here also has zones that you can see on the outside. The difference is going to be on the bottom. These are always either going to be white or as they get a little older they're going to be off-white like you see on some of these. Whereas the false turkey tail is going to be more tan. It's very smooth as well, like smooth leather. Whereas these, you can feel the pores as they get older. And the turkey tail might be the most well-studied, traditionally used medicinal mushroom, uh, good for anti-tumor properties, anti-cancers on certain cancers, also anti-inflammatory and many other medicinal properties. Here is some elderberry flowers. Everybody thinks of elderberries as medicinal and they are, but also the flowers are medicinal. You can use these and make a tea out of them. And from what I've either read or studied somewhere is they may be as medicinal if not more so than the berries themselves. The reason I'm working with a piece of glass is because when you're beginning to learn how to work in flint now is all flint is is a natural glass. So glass will be your easiest to find resource. It's pretty. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of impurities in it like some of the flint and obsidian that you'll either buy online or that you can find. So glass is usually your best option because it's everywhere and it's free. You pick it up, break the bottom off of it, and chip yourself out an arrowhead. Alright, now that I got my general shape profile, I'm going to try to take a little more strategized hits to it. Uh, that way I'm not breaking it all to bits and uh, 
then I'll go in there and I'll pressure flake and that's where you get your real fine edges and work done, detail work. So obviously these are deer antlers that I'm using to work these arrowheads. You can use a combination of things. You could use a rock, you could use a bone, I can use copper as well. Like what I find at a scrapyard, I throw some tape around it and I can use that to shape up my arrowheads. But I, I like more natural stuff like uh, the antlers. Pressure flaking is where you're going to get your fine detail. And that's also how you're going to put your notches into your arrowheads. So I'm just going to show you how it works real quick. I'm going to take this arrowhead, which I've kind of worn off the tip on, and I'm going to put a, another tip back on it. And you take it and you lean it into the sharp edge. And since I've got more thickness on this side, I'm going to be leaning it that way. The more you lean into it, the longer your flake's going to go. See that flake come off right there. Now I've got a brand new needle sharp tip on that and that's how you pressure flake. Well, at one moment you're walking around enjoying nature, taking in all the beauty that is nature that God created on this beautiful earth and at the next moment, hey, is that an ivory billed woodpecker I see? I think it is. I think it is. I better get a closer look. Well, next thing you know, you're lost. You've been looking for the trail for a while and you can't seem to find your way back. Now it's time to plan, strategize. Don't freak out because it doesn't help anything. First thing you want to do mark your area make sure people who are looking for you or will be looking for you are gonna know where you've been i found an area it's right off the game trail it's a big open spot i feel like i can lay down and be comfortable i have some logs here that i can sit on while i'm waiting i'm going to try to keep my mind busy uh, doing something proactive not just sitting here waiting to be saved but thinking about a plan how long is it going to be before people's looking for me? Do I need to start to look for some water? Do I need to start slapping those skeeters that are getting all over me? Probably so. Now you could start yelling, but the more you yell, the more you're going to stress out your voice and you're already in a stressful situation. So save your voice and here's what I suggest you do. Find two decent sized rocks, bang them together. Now that sound can be heard from miles away, further than what your voice can travel. And it'll keep you to where you can yell for help if the situation arises instead of stressing your voice out to where it doesn't work. I'm gonna sit down and evaluate everything I have on me. So I didn't wait. I, I went ahead and marked my area, uh, my campsite. I'm going to pretend I've been in this scenario for a day and a half. I'm out of water. I've got to go. I've got to move. I had made a plan yesterday on which way I was going to go. There was a valley off in the distance. Looks like the lowest spot. Keeping in mind that water always flows downhill. So I'm going to head that way. Trying to stay alive. So I'm heading that way. As soon as I've hammered in this stick, I put a rock to mark the very tip of the shadow where it was and where it's going to be moving to. I'll set another rock. This is called a sun stick. As far as navigation is concerned, if you know which way you want to go, but you're not sure which way's east, west, north, south, all that, my chickens are going to help me out on this video, I guess. Then you make yourself a sun stick. Now. Ideally, you want a spot out in the open, 
but you don't have to have. You can be in the woods and you can find the top of a tree or something like that and follow the tip of that shadow as long as you can keep in mind which tree it is that you're following or something of that nature. Now right here, I got the stick that I pounded in the ground. Uh, about an hour ago, I put this rock at the very tip of the shadow. 30 minutes later, I put this in there. And this is about another 30, 40 minutes later, I put this in there which tells me the sun come up in the east that way. It's doing like it always does, travels west. You can put a stick right there. And then, you know, if that way is east, that way is north, you got south and west. And that way you can make a determination of which way you want to go, if you know a road is this way or what have you. And you can use that as a backstop, or you can follow it as a rail. Uh, any way that you uh, think you can find out in your mind where you want to go and, and what your goal is in the end. And if it's to be rescued, and that way you know there's something that you can run into, uh, this will give you an idea how to get there. All right, so I've got a game trail here, and I'm gonna try to set up a snare trap on this game trail. The reason I like snare traps so well is because if you're doing like a figure four you can get small animals but you can get more medium sized animals with a snare trap or maybe even small large small large animals if that works and um, I can usually set up two or three of these by the time it takes me to make a figure four trap so that's why I'm a big fan of it however if you live in a state like I do in Alabama snare traps are illegal and so uh, you wouldn't be able to practice this at home, but uh, you could certainly set up some if you didn't leave them there and uh, give it a shot at how it went. So I'm going to try to set up one real quick and show you how it works. Got a piece of 550 cord here, paracord, and uh, all you got to do, all I do to teach my students, I try to keep this stupid simple, is you go left, left hand over right, make that little loop there. Okay, so left over right, and then I stick my right finger through and pull out the loop. And there you got a snare. Now you got to make sure you grab the right side, because if you grab the other side, and if that's tied to your tree, then uh, it's just going to pull loose on the animal, and you'll have nothing but a cord left. But you get the right side, should pull tight, tighten up around them. My stick in the ground wasn't quite long enough. It kept wanting to pull out. So I had to move this log in here to help hold it down. And it should help funnel the animals a little bit more if they want to get off trail or what have you. Gets hung up in there, starts fighting to get out. And then he starts pulling on the snare log. Now, if that was an actual survival situation, I would fine tune that to where that would not hang up that much. And okay, of course, there's different types of hunting. You have inactive hunting where you're setting traps, like what I was showing you just earlier. And then you have active hunting where you're actually actively going out looking for game um, using, you know, spears, slings, uh, sticks, but I was going to talk about making a bundle bow. <clears throat> now when making a bow, uh, some of the hardest thing is finding good straight sticks. Here's a good straight one I picked up uh, a little while ago. And uh, here's these right here. These are cattails, which they're pretty strong. You wouldn't think they're as strong as they are, but they can make a good bow. The only problem I have with cattails is they have these little layers that if you stick them the wrong way, if you're shooting them, they'll leave little splinters in your fingers. So I don't like that too well. Um, but if you find privet, privet grows pretty straight. It has little straight stalks and they're pretty easy to make arrows out of. I got a couple out of here that I didn't put arrowheads on. I just fire harden the ends. All right, and that would be enough strength right there to kill a small animal or at least to stun it so you can run up on it, rush him, and uh, you know, finish the job. All right, about the blacksmithing classes, I give my students around six to eight hours to finish their blades. 
So I'm going to show you an older video that I made a, a titanium dagger for a guy. I may have spent a few days on it, I don't remember. Um, but we're not going to be making something that elaborate. Most of my blades that we make for my students are pretty common. Sometimes we can use copper, sometimes bronze, sometimes, sometimes steel. It really depends on what you're looking to make. And a lot of times we'll be working with this spring steel. It's a 1060 spring steel. Just remember it is going to be your knot that you personally made. And for the price that you pay for the class and using my materials, you can make your money back on the knot that you design. Making in the short video, he wanted it made out of 6-4 uh, hardenable titanium. After forging, I've cut the edges off, cut any spots that I see. I mean it's beautiful on the thickness there's a little bit of swivel there which I can take that out fairly easy Here it is, uh, finished product. I was just getting out my measuring tape and everything because I'm ready to list this sword. In today's world, with the troubles that we see, survival and self-reliance may be more important as it ever has been. And I can teach you how to survive. This book here, the Holy Bible, can teach you how to live even if you die. And there is no survival book in the world that can teach you that unless it's based off this book here.